Hi guys, I am Paul Spooner. I'm a Catholic and a father of eight. And this is my story about going to Japan, uh, why we did it, what we learned there, and why we came back. I mean, it's a pretty short story in those terms. <laughs> I, um, I was working at a company that does aerospace manufacturing and they had some equipment that was installed in Japan. And so uh, they needed people on our, to go there to support the machinery. Now, most companies have someone who's just on staff, who's permanently at the facility, who does it, you know, 24-7 around the clock uh, support and stuff. But Electro Impact is kind of a unique company because they have, at the time, they had like 600 employees and about 500 of them were engineers. So basically everyone's an engineer in Electro Impact. And uh, as a result, they didn't have anyone full-time on staff, you know, in Japan. And they also didn't want to get someone a, a permanent work visa there. Um, because the paperwork was really complicated and it was expensive or something. I don't know. But for the long and the short of it was they needed someone every six months to go there. Now, you could have two guys to switch off. But um, they had a hard time getting people to go over to Japan for six months at a time. And, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Because most engineers wanted to be doing engineering and not doing support work. Um, but it sounded really cool to me. And I had a family at the time. But the guy who owned the company was super supportive of families. Uh, he would give, like, big bonuses depending on how many kids you had, that kind of thing. Very cool guy, uh, Jewish guy. And um, so he was like, yeah, I'll send you over. I'll pay for your family. I'll pay for your lodging. I'll pay for all your airfare. Go for it. You know, we need somebody over there. And so it was like, awesome. Like, six-month trip to Japan, uh, airfare, and, it, you know, not all expenses, but we get per diem. It's just, like, fantastic. Who would say no to that? Well, mostly everyone. Um, but we're like, we're going to do it. And so uh, signed up to go to Japan and then, um, or I, I mean, I guess I volunteered. So I put my name in the hat. I was like, hey, I raised my hand. Hey, I'd be interested in going if, uh, if you guys want me to go. And uh, then they said yes. And so uh, around the time that they said, yeah, go for it. We're pulling the trigger. We found out that my wife was pregnant and was going to be uh, due to have the baby while we were still in Japan for about a month. So it was like, okay, do we really want to do this? And um, so if you heard from my, my other testimony video about how I became a Catholic, my wife and I were both Christian at the time. Uh, we weren't Catholic until we came back to California after we got back from Japan. Uh, so it was about two years after we got back from Japan, or a year and a half, somewhere in there. Um, and so we were Christians, and we're just like, you know, God's going to take care of us. It'll be cool. And uh, yeah, let's do it. And so we said, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to double down. We're going to make this happen. And um, so we went over there. I'll go into all the details, but long story short, uh, my wife had the baby there. It was awesome. Uh, it turned out as well as we could have expected in a country that we're, we don't speak the native language and we don't have any health insurance there and, uh, you know, all the complications one might expect. But um, it was pretty hard on her. I mean, the whole thing was pretty hard on my wife, but she made it through. And uh, then she went home a month early. I spent the last month, uh, September, in Japan and then uh, came back home and went back to work doing my normal engineering job. So that's like the short story. And now for the long version, if you uh, want to stick around for the details. So this is my hometown of Camarillo. And uh, that's where we lived before we moved up to work at Electro Impact. And Electro Impact is up in, where is it? Mukilteo, right up here. It's actually right here, Electro Impact. So that's where I worked. And uh, so we were in Mukilteo, and that's because um, Mukilteo is right next to Boeing. So Boeing's right here. And uh, so a lot of the stuff they did for, was for Boeing. Um, a number They worked for another number of other companies as well but the main client was boeing or one of their main clients was boeing and boeing has plants all over the place so i think we can just like search for like boeing plants and it's just going to be everywhere yeah so there's one in renton um there's one in everett there's one over here in charleston and then uh, what happens with, like, when you get really big international companies that are, like, selling stuff internationally, selling, like, huge things like airplanes, um, the way that the whole, like, thing works... Hey, Gwen! Oh, yeah, I'd love to go to the park. All right. I'll pick this up. I'll, I'm, all you'll see is a cut, but I'll be back.
So the way that big international business works is if you want to sell a giant airplane in, say, Japan, then you have to build a manufacturing plant in Japan so that they got a slice of the pie, basically. So you give them a bunch of jobs and a bunch of industry and a bunch of imports and a bunch of tax revenue. And in exchange, they'll buy X number of airplanes from you. And it's not like an exact number, but a lot of times it's almost an exact number. So anyway, um, they have a manufacturing plant for Boeing, Boeing does, in Japan. So the, the two com um, big cities that people know about are Tokyo. Of course, everyone knows about Tokyo. It's the largest city used to be in the world. I don't know if it is anymore. And Osaka, which is the old capital and kind of like the tourist destination. Uh, we've got a big military base there. So all the military guys know about Osaka and all the weeaboos know about Tokyo. But there's the third largest city in Japan, Nagoya, and that is the industrial center. So Tokyo is like the center of commerce and technology, and Osaka is the center of culture and history. Nagoya is the center of industry and, and capital. So we went to Nagoya, and down here on the docks uh, is Kawasaki Heavy Industries, Nagoya. Let's see if they got that new building. Yeah, they do. They built this whole building since I was there. Um, anyway, so that's Kawasaki Heavy Industries. I worked there for six months, and uh, but we didn't live there. Now, there's like a bunch of housing and stuff all around here. Um, but one thing you will learn about the Japanese, if you uh, ever spend time there, or even if really if you like do business with them, or if you ask anyone in Asia, is that the Japanese are impossibly racist. They're like, they're super duper racist. Now, like, I don't consider racism to be a fundamental evil. It certainly can be a, um, the root of evil of prejudice, but racism in and of itself, just saying like, hey, there's differences between the races and like, we need to honor those and respect those and acknowledge them. Nothing wrong with that. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with Japanese culture in that it's racist, but it is really, really racist. And for people who do consider racism to be like a fundamental problem, uh, it's like really hard to get used to. So um, anyway, they're super racist. You can even see it in the language. They have a, a, a pictographic language, that, you know, these characters here, these these uh, katakana. And then they are, I think, is it katakana or hiragana? Anyway, they've got an entirely separate, oh, those are kanji. Those are kanji. And then there's katakana, I believe, is the Japanese alphabet. They've got like a phonetic alphabet, like the English alphabet, which, which is kind of phonetic. The Japanese one is like super phonetic. It's very strict. They're, they're very conservative as well. But then they have an entirely separate alphabet, a phonetic alphabet for foreign words. So the, whatever the one is for Japanese words only uses Japanese words for that one. And then the separate foreign words are in the separate language. So it's like completely separated, right? All the foreign stuff, keep that outside. We don't want it mixing. We don't want it intermingling with any of our pure Japanese language. And so same thing with their housing. So you cannot, as a foreigner, you cannot get, and the word for foreigner is gaijin. So like, as a gaijin, you cannot get housing anywhere in Japan. You can rent a hotel, uh, you know, like a room in a hotel as a guest, but you can't like get a house, you can't have an apartment <coughs> anywhere, except there is one place. And I don't know if this is the only place in Nagoya, but it was the only, it was one of the only places that we could find. Uh, I mean, we didn't find it personally that the, the company found, uh, Electro Impact found for us. And that is, let's see if I can find it still. Let's see, it's on this side of the tracks. It's up a store from the Family Mart. It's right here. This one right here. This building. The Free Bell Apartments in Nagoya. That's the one. And uh, so this was the, the place where we stayed because this is a hotel kind of, it's like, it's an apartment building, but it's an apartment building for foreigners specifically for English teachers. So if you taught English anywhere, like in the whole county, you would stay in this apartment. This was set aside for foreigners. Foreigners stayed there. I don't think there were any native Japanese people there. Uh, there might have been, or like the office staff or something, but like, you know, for foreigners. So again, like very separate, very clear lines. Don't mix things together. Don't get them confused. Uh, so let's get 3D view on this because this is a really fun place. So it had this giant, well, it still has this giant atrium in the middle. You can kind of see that uh, in the middle there. And we were on this side. Let's see. We were 
on, I don't remember, I think it was the seventh floor, like one of these apartments right in here. And so we looked out on this other apartment and like this, this part of the city here. It wasn't, you know, a great view, but uh, yeah, you could kind of see, uh, I don't think you could see Noriaki. Could you see Noriaki? I think you could see like a little corner of Noritake Garden from our apartment. Um, but when we were there, it was being renovated and you can't see it now, but the entire outside was just covered in scaffolding. Uh, scaffolding and tarps and all kinds of stuff. And so for a while, we couldn't even see out our windows because they had like tarps up and everything. The whole thing was being repainted or I don't know, they were redoing the stucco or something. Um, but as a result, and as a side note, I hate, uh, on a Sunday, I think, when they nobody was working, I climbed out the window, climbed down to the scaffolding, got up on the roof, and looked around. You know, looked inside these big, uh, these big things where all the elevator equipment was. It was fun. It was a good time. Uh, don't tell the Japanese though; they'd be horrified. So that was our apartment, and then you could go down the stairs and across the street and under this little uh, walkway here, this little road, walk underneath the railroad tracks. So this is like the the main Nagoya Station railway track for the Shinkansen. I think that was the Shinkansen over here, the, the bullet train. And then this is like the the um, local train, I think. And uh, anyway, there's like huge number of trains that went through there. And after a while, you don't you get used to it. You don't even hear it anymore. But then we would go down the street and there was this tiny little... It's probably still there. Everything is still there in Japan. It's a very old country. Uh, I think this was the market. That was probably it. And you could get like, you know, fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and all that kind of thing. And uh, one of the things, another thing that's kind of strange about Japan, I, I mean, strange to us, is like in the United States, you'll get like, you'll have your whole foods with like premium uh, fruit, you know, like fresh organic fruit or whatever. It's all beautiful. And then you've got like your your um, Walmart, right, with like, you know, just like normal fruit and vegetables and like normal food. And then maybe you've got your dollar store where it's like, eh, they're almost rotten, but they're not rotten yet. And they're still edible, technically. And, like, if you can't really afford anything better, then, yeah, you can eat that. And it's fine. You know, you're, you're not going to, like, enjoy it totally, but you'll be fine. It's not going to hurt you or anything. Um, but in Japan, there's, like, a tier above the, like, the top level tier, which is, like, Japanese food. And, and none of those other tiers exist. You cannot buy bad food in Japan. You only get top notch. Ichiban, right? First quality. First class. Like, the only thing available is the very best of the best and everything else is just they don't sell it because nobody's gonna buy it because you're in japan and like nobody wants second tier anything so uh so yeah all the food fantastic kind of pricey not like super duper pricey but like you know kind of pricey and uh but just incredible like everything was just perfect right because like that's what japan does japan makes it perfect if you can't make it perfect you just kill yourself which is another thing that happens in Japan a lot. They commit suicide. Uh, but we didn't have to experience any of that when we were there. So I would drive out of the apartment and uh, normally you'd get to work by taking the underground. Uh, what was that called? The subway, I guess? I forget what they called it in Japan. They're, they had a word for it. Um, so, but you would walk up the street here and across the street to Kamajima. Kamajima Station. Let's see if it'll show it. Yes, it does. And there is the line that the Kamajima station's on, the orange line. And basically to get anywhere in, in uh, Nagoya, you'd take that orange line down to Kintetsu Nagoya, and then there you'd transfer to whatever other subway line you wanted to get on. Um, although a few of them were on this one. But uh, we were very lucky or blessed to have uh, our one of the guys that worked at Electro Impact who worked here... Um, who had the stint before us. So he was on the six month stint before we were there over the winter. And uh, Thomas, I think. Pretty sure it's Thomas. Anyway, uh, it doesn't matter to you. So Thomas was there and uh, he went to school for robotics in Tokyo. And so he knew Japanese fluently. He understood the culture. He you know knew how to do everything. And so he set us up with a subway pass and you could get your little subway pass card. Normally, that's only for people who like live permanently in Japan or Japanese citizens or whatever. But he was able, to, because he could talk to them, he's like, oh yeah, blah, 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 we'll you know, fix you up. And so he got us this subway pass card. 
And so then you just take the subway pass and you can fill it up in any, any uh, automated terminal, you know, put some more um, yen in it, and then you'd be able to go anywhere with your subway pass card. And so that was fantastic. I didn't really go on the subway much. We'd occasionally go on the weekends, but my wife and kids, uh, wife and three kids at the time, uh, would, the oldest at the time was five, three, and yeah, and one. Yeah, so five, uh, five, three, and one, two girls, and then um, my son, Teddy, and then afterward, my, my son, Barnabas, was born. Um, but so my wife and three kids would go all over the place. They would, you know, because they had the whole day. They could go anywhere they want. And uh, the subway is really, really cheap in Japan, so you can just basically go anywhere. And so they would go all over to the parks. They'd visit uh, the Natural History Museum. Um, oh, wow, they're putting a mall in. Didn't there used to be... I thought there was a museum here. Oh no, this is the museum. The Toyota Commemorative Museum of Industry. That was really cool. I went I went there with them one time. But they would go, you know, all over the place on the subway and stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. So, and everyone there was very friendly. They're very hospitable toward foreigners, especially since it's very clear, like we have pretty light hair. My hair is not very light, but it's light compared to Japanese. Japanese have all black hair and uh, all straight hair, you know, just like, Dark eyes, very strict. Hey! So I was going on about how the Japanese are like, have a very specific look. They're, they're you know, genetically very similar. And uh, so we just stood out like crazy. You know, all my kids have blonde hair, they've got blue eyes. And uh, so the, the Japanese ladies, everybody would just be like crying, oh, kawaii, kawaii desu ne! Which means, oh, they're so cute, they're so cute, right? And uh, so, um, attracted a lot of attention you know people would help Anna out in the in public and you know like with stuff help her with doors and things she's a stroller and uh, so she got she was treated very well they're, they're very hospitable but you know like strict boundaries you know you stay in this specific apartment building that's where you live and you uh, don't speak too much Japanese that's one of the weird things like we're impressed when people learn English well I mean maybe not too much but uh, People are impressed in the United States. We're like, oh, you know, you speak English so well. It's like, that's great. In Japan, they don't really want you to speak Japanese very well because, like, that's their language. And you're a foreigner. You're an outsider. So, like, don't really try to speak Japanese too well. If you can speak, I think there's, like, five words, then then it's like, your Japanese is great. That's all you need. Um, excuse me. Sumimasen. That's that's really important. Um, good morning. Ohio gozaimasu. Hello or good morning. Um, thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato is, is thank you, and gozaimasu is like very much. Uh, arigato gozaimasu. That's thank you very much. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, is that what's three phrases? So that's basically it. That's basically all you need. <laughs> and they all know English because uh, they all have to learn it in school. But if you get outside of the big cities, even though they know English, they don't want to speak English. Because, again, like big cities is where they meet the foreigners and like do the stuff. Out in the countryside, that's Japanese territory. They only speak Japanese out there. So, like, you know. They could talk to you in English if they wanted to, but <laughs> there's this one time, well, uh, maybe we'll get there. There's this one time I was out, all right, we'll do it now. There was this one time I was out in, uh, where I was going from Nagoya, I was driving. Okay, so, man, we're getting too many tangents. So, Nagoya, we were staying up here by the by the train station, because that was the only place we could stay. But the the uh, plant was way down here, in the by the docks, in the industrial zone. So, um... You could take a, a train, but the train, I think the closest train station was like way over here in, uh, in, at, near the, near the, um, port, the port building. Legoland Resort. Oh man. I don't think that must've opened after we were there. It seems like we would've gone. Um, so, so like it was a long way. So like you could take the subway and then ride a bike, but the company provided us with a rental car. So that was really nice too. So we had a rental car. And so I would just drive, uh, I think it was like 45 minutes to an hour every day, closer to 50 minutes, um, from Nagoya Station, basically, down to Kawasaki Heavy Industries. Let's just see what the route is these days. Directions from, no, not your location. I don't want to drive from North America. We want to drive from... this place. There was a parking garage in the basement. 40 minutes. There we go. Uh, let's see. They're recommending going up that way. 
yeah, I could do that. Uh, the way I eventually ended up going was down on the highway, down this way. Uh, but this way was a little bit more straightforward. So yeah, yeah, that's just about how I, how you do it. Although I think I think there was a different route. I don't know. It's been a long time. It's been six years. I'd have to trace it, and nobody wants to see me trace the route, the old route through Japan. But anyway, I would drive to Japan or drive to uh, to Kawasaki every morning, and then back every evening, and uh, that was my day. I was a I was a, a businessman. I was a what is it? What do they call it? Um, the Japanese like. Uh, Salaryman, just salaryman, right? Like you're on salary, you show up every day, you do your time, you go home. And uh, when things were working well, which is uh, yeah, so this is the building I was working in here. This building is brand new. Uh, it wasn't. It was like just under construction. They had just broken ground when I got there. So I got to, I got to go on a meeting as one of the the representatives for our clients. So we had two, one. We had one big machine in this building. One machine in this building, and then I think they were going to install three over here. And so I got to go over and inspect the foundations. Are these up to spec? Of course they're up to spec. It's Japan. Everything's up to spec. But, you know, you have to have inspections. You have to, like, sign off on the thing. So, anyway, that was fun. So, yeah, good to see that building's up. They must be under production now. Anyway, so I drive over. I park in the parking lot. I'd walk all the way over to the front entrance, sign in with my badge, uh, walk through the factory... Occasionally, I'd stop off at the at the machine, or I'd go over and stop off at the machine over here, um, and then walk over to my. Oh, they don't have the little the little cells anymore. So it used to be. So I'd walk out this door right here, this one right there, out past the HVAC equipment on this little alternating. They still have the alternating concrete step pathway, and then there used to be. You can kind of see the shadow of them still. There used to be um, a bunch of ISO box offices out here. And that's where all the, the gaijin would have their offices. So that's where we stayed. We couldn't have an office inside the building. That's for Japanese people. Outside the building is okay for foreigners. Temporary housing only. So we had one of those. It was like a double, it's a double wide <laughs> ISO box uh, office. And that was me and Suzuki-san, who was the... Uh, so, so you can't have... <laughs> Ah, Japanese, it's crazy. So you can't have a, um, an office in Japan, right? Like, you're a foreign company. Only Japanese companies can have offices in Japan. And you can't have a contract with a Japanese company as a foreign company. You can't have a contract with them directly. That's like, that would be blurring the lines too much. You have to go through an intermediate company. I forget the name of it, but there's some, like, there's this intermediate business. And so our company, Electro Impact, had a contract with this intermediate company, and the intermediate company was the one was in Japan, and they were, they were a special company that just did this kind of transaction. All they did was have contracts with foreigners so that they could draw the line at this company, and then nothing on the other side of that company was outside Japan, right? They could, all the Japanese people could interact with the intermediary company, and then the intermediary company did all the interaction with... The, with the outsiders, with the gaijin, right? With all those dirty foreigners. So uh, so there was a translator on site all the time that I was there. Uh, and I think he was I think he was permanently on staff. So he was like, you know, Japanese citizen. And uh, and he spoke English. Not great, but well enough, right? He was a translator and that, that was fine. And he was also an engineer, I think. I think he was an engineer. Anyway, so it was his job to be there and be able to translate whenever we needed help translating so that I didn't have to speak Japanese. And again, they didn't really want you to be able to speak Japanese. Um, Thomas was, they liked Thomas because he was, he had gone to school there and he, you know, grown up with their, in their culture and stuff. So it was kind of like, he was inducted and he was kind of Japanese, right? He was Japanese enough. And so it was fine. But uh, for most people, it's like, no, 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 don't, don't bother to try to speak Japanese to us. Just speak through the translator. So uh, anyway, so Suzuki-san and I shared an office and and there was, it was a double wide, so it was, there was like a partition right down the middle. It wasn't actually partitioned, but you could see like the line where they joined them together. And so his desk was on one side of the thing. My desk was on the other side, right? Just to keep the you know, separate, you wouldn't want to like mix up stuff. <laughs> and so, and all my stuff was on the Gaijin side of the office. And all of his stuff was on the Japanese side of the office. 
And uh, occasionally he would like print out a thing on his side of the office and like walk it over to me and give it to me. And I'd be like, all right, thank you, Suzuki-san. Oh, I'm going to go some off. He's like, oh, your English is so good. And right, <laughs> like the whole thing. There's a whole ritual. Anyway, so, uh, so I'd sit in the office and when things were going well, I would just sit there all day and then I would go home. And uh, when things didn't go well, then uh, Suzuki-san would come over and be like, oh, Paro-san, uh, so sorry, but the uh, machine is uh, having trouble and uh, we need to go and uh, see, uh, is uh, very pleased, is okay. And I was like, yeah, 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 it's fine, it's fine, let's go. And so we'd go over to the machine and, and they would say what was wrong and he would translate it and then I would say, okay, well, you know, take some pictures and send it back to the company or maybe, you know, like, you try pushing this button to reset the home or whatever, whatever was going on in the machine. And uh, only a few times did I have to actually do anything. And uh, the, the, the highlight of my career there doing support was there is this, um, let me see if I can find some pictures of these machines. Electroimpact.com products. Let's see, it was drilling and fastening. Flex track, robotics, composites, semi-automatic riveters. It wasn't a D-frame. Maybe it's here. Semi-auto. No, no, that's not right. Full barrel, let's see. Maybe it's on here. Full barrel riveting machine. Composites, automated, fastening. That's closer. Here we go, the E5000 full barrel fastening system. That's the one. That's the one. So that's the machine I worked on. Let's see if we've got a picture. Yeah, there's a better picture. So this uh, this is the machine. That's that's a pretty good picture. And it's got this long arm, and it, you can see this thing here is, is like on a on a track, and it, it tracks this way. I think it goes sideways. So this whole thing is cantilevered out, and you would put a uh, this is a carbon fiber barrel. And it's seamless. It's one piece all the way around the whole thing. Um, but as a result you can't get at both sides of it because it's seamless. And so you've got this giant machine that sticks through the middle of it. And uh, let's see if I can get a picture from the outside. There you go. So there it is around the outside of that long, that long cantilevered arm. And so this piece would detach and move out of the way over this way. And then you'd slide the whole, uh, you can't see my hand, you'd slide the whole barrel in on the end of that thing. And then uh, over the end of it, and then the other piece would move in underneath the arm and, uh, you know, and support the whole thing. And then it would have an inside and outside. Where's the, there's the outside piece that's on this big tower. Here we go. So here's the big tower. Here's the outside piece that goes up and down the tower. And it's got five axes, you know, can reorient all the, you know, different axes to get it exactly square with the barrel. And then same thing with the inside machine. Oh, there's a good picture. There's kind of a good picture. It's this big, you know, boxy thing. It's got the riveting thing, drilling thing on the other end. And so this machine would drill a hole, uh, put a fastener in, um, crimp it basically it's a rivet but it was like a crimped rivet so it's yeah it's it fasten you know secure the rivet and then um, move on to the next hole and it would do you know thousands of these holes thousands of thousands you can see well I don't know if you can't see but um, the hole inside was held on with temporary fasteners and so then occasionally it would have to stop and they'd take the temporary fasteners out and then we'd keep drilling and fastening all these ribs on the inside because the whole inside of this thing yeah Probably won't. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's a pretty good picture. So you can see all these things in here. These are ribs, and then the things this way are stringers, and so it would fasten the ribs and stringers permanently onto the, the carbon fiber body. So that's what that machine did. So anyway, at one point, uh, the company was, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, was transferring ownership of this machine, the maintenance of the machine, from the, what was it, from like the Kawasaki plant maintenance team over to like the Kawasaki manufacturing maintenance team or something. I forget the details, but there was like this transfer of between internal teams. And um, and Japan, like it's very, like many Eastern cultures, very culturally uh, honor bound. So it's like, you know, you have to maintain face, don't embarrass people, don't embarrass your, your company or your nation, or like, you know, stick to the rules and stick to the plan, you know, like do exactly what you're supposed to do. And so right during this process of transferring from the old company that was doing the support to the new company that was doing support and maintenance, 
uh, one of the operators crashed this machine, the outer machine, into the ring, this big support ring. You can see all these clamps on here. So each of these are, are I think, pneumatic clamps that hold on to the barrel. And uh, it's this huge, heavy ring. I don't know if you can see a picture. Maybe you can see it better here. Yeah, it's this big, thick, you know, like two inch thick steel ring. And uh, so one of the operators accidentally crashed somehow. And there are like overrides. Yeah, there's, you can see just the rings without the barrel in it. Um, anyway, one of the, one of the operators overrode the, the safeties and somehow crashed the outer head into the ring and misaligned the tombstone. So the tombstone is this big piece of metal right here, this big old hunk of, of steel. And um, they bent it. And so it didn't line up anymore. And so then like the drill and the rivet thing couldn't go through anymore. And they're just like, oh no, what are we gonna do? And uh, so they worked at it and they worked at it for a while. And, um, but they weren't willing to change anything to the degree they did have to because it was actually bent like the piece was bent so you'd have to like actually bend it back and they didn't want to like change anything too much because then they might break it forever so um kawasaki-san comes to me and he's like oh pass on oh it's a very bad trouble uh we need uh we need to f fix machine but uh oh how do they do it and they suck through their teeth when it's like really there's like a really uncomfortable situation like this uh this machine's um Crash the head. You know, went through the whole thing. Crash the head, and, and we need to need to fix it. But ah, uh, uh, we cannot fix a machine when uh, anyone is uh, can see how we uh, yeah how it is fixed. Uh, we must fix we must fix machine uh, without um, embarrassing any of uh, anyone. So uh, maybe maybe during lunch time. Uh, you and I uh, will work on machine and maybe we fix during lunch time and then uh, then when they return then it is uh, back in operation back in operation uh, do you think it's possible and I'm like yeah let's try it <laughs> we're gonna do it so so all that we went in there and we'd been in there for a while but they're like oh we're gonna fix it we're gonna fix it and, you know they work on it work on it and then so we go in there right before lunchtime and the head you know guy the the maintenance guy comes up he's they're all so t short so he comes up to me i'm short for like a western guy you know i'm what five seven um but but they're like they're all like you know five foot or whatever so anyway he comes up and he's like uh very sorry but uh machine uh cannot fix is impossible so we go to lunch. Okay, <laughs> they all go off to lunch. So they all march out, and then uh, Suzuki-san and I are there with the machine, and we gotta fix it. But we gotta fix it in such a way that <laughs> that we can't tell them what went wrong. We're just like we fixed it, and uh, so <laughs> so this machine has this these huge motors. I, I mean, they probably don't have a picture where you can see them. They're all hidden underneath these heads. And they run on these, so they're these huge, heavy motors, um, because they've got to be able to move this whole machine pretty quickly, accelerate and decelerate. Like this whole, it's like a, it's like a building almost, it's like big, heavy, multiple ton like machine. It's got to move the whole thing really quickly so that it can move to the next rivet hole. Bam, bam, you know, boom, bow, and it's fastened. Right, move to the next one, bow, bam, it's fastened. So they got to be able to like move to the holes as quickly as possible so they can get the whole thing turned around. So the motor is like super overpowered. Um, so what we did is, and over at this end, uh, let's see if I can find a, a picture of the operator station. You can't really see it from here. Maybe there a little bit. There's there's this operator station with all these railings and stuff. And um, so, and they have like some tools over there. And so um, I'm like, Suzuki-san, do we have a sledgehammer? And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 uh, hi, 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 right? They all speak Japanese, hi, hi means, yeah, I understand, I got it. So he'd go and get the sledgehammer, you know, like a big old dead blow hammer, maybe 20 pounds or something, a uh, big old mallet. And so I'm like, all right, so it's, it's like this, and we, we line the thing up, and we see, okay, it's got to move like, you know, five millimeters this way. And so I get that thing, and I just like, wham, wail on it a couple times, and it's not moving at all. And so I'm like, okay, I know what to do. So we, we jog the head down, we get as close to the steps as we can, and then I just take that sledgehammer and I wedge it, handle, you know, the handle in there, right next to the, the tombstone. You can't even see my hands. I don't know why I'm doing this here. So there's there's the, the steps, 
and then like I take the handle and just wedge it in right be beside the head so that there's like the head here and then the steps down here. And then we just start jogging that machine and we just jog the machine over until the head gets cranked over back in line. And uh, then we jog it back and check it and it's like, oh, it's not quite aligned enough. And so we jam that thing back in there and just like jog the machine and you just like push the button and it's like kink, 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 and <laughs> keeps moving the whole thing. And uh, the stairs are creaking and the handle is like getting a little bit bent. And uh, the corner of the handle, because it's all like this big, you know, plastic thing, like there's this permanent dent in the corner of the handle where the thing's just been like cranking into it. And uh, so we just jog the machine back and like get the whole tombstone kind of bent back into shape. And uh, then we're like, yep, yeah, looks good. You know, jog it back. So unload the thing and yeah, it looks fine. It's lined up again and uh, put everything away. And it took us like 20 minutes or whatever. And then we just like wait there until they come back. And they're like, so is uh, how is the machine doing? And, and we're like, oh, we're, we're very sorry. Uh, it was impossible to fix, but uh, we have temporary solution, temporary solution only, uh, but maybe it is okay to run now, right? And uh, so they're like, oh, and so they look at it and they're like, oh, oh, how did you do it? It's like, uh, oh, it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was not, uh, it was very difficult. It is not, we cannot tell you how we did it, right? And it's like, really, it's too hard. And, uh, and they're like, oh, how would you, how would you, uh, with a sledgehammer, and I was like, oh, sledgehammer, and wham, right, and with a sledgehammer, and like, oh, no, we tried that, and I was like, oh, well, you know, Americans are very strong, and like, oh, right, right, <laughs> so it was, it was a good time, so, uh, so they, we got it working again, and uh, everything was fine, and then there was, I think, like, two weeks later, there was a scheduled, or, I mean, no, it must have been a month, it was like, it was quite a while, maybe it was only two weeks, two weeks or three weeks or something, there was a scheduled downtime where they're going to do maintenance on it. And so we called up uh, home base back in, in the States and we're like, hey, guys, you know, here's what happened. Didn't wrote the whole thing up, right? Uh, here's the thing. They crashed the head. We had to realign it. I jammed with a sledgehammer and cranked it over. It looks like it's fine, but you're probably going to want to place a whole tombstone. So, uh, you know, I hope you got us have got a spare one of those. And while you're at it, here's some of the things, you know, there's some other stuff that we wanted to change on the headstone while they were doing it. So they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll fix that. Uh, there were some shims, actually. So they, when they align the headstone, you put some shims under it to get it exactly lined up. And so we're like, as long as you're putting shims in, like, here's the thickness of all the shims, so that when you make the new tombstone, it'll be the right size, and you don't have to shim it anymore. And uh, so anyway, we did all that, and um, yeah, two weeks later, they came out and did the did the alignment, and uh, we went to Korea. So one of the things, yeah, let's go back to... The screen here so one of the things you have to do because we weren't permanent like we didn't have a work visa we were there on a visitor's visa and a visitor's visa is good for three months three months and then you have to leave the country and then come back again and you can do that twice you can for a total of six months in any one year period so we were there for three months then during the scheduled downtime we left and went to korea stayed for a couple days and then came back and uh, so Korea's not that far. It was a short flight. Went over to Korea. There's a whole story about being in Korea. It was, it was a good time. Um, and what else happened? Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to tell a story about going out into the countryside and, and speaking to the guy who didn't want to speak English. So over in Kobe, there is a bridge. The Akashi Kyoko. Kaikyo. Kaikyo. Akashi Kaikyo Bridge longest suspension bridge in the world that is until like i think a couple years ago when they built the one in turkey uh which is significantly longer but i still think this one's better because it's japanese and it's always better here let's get a good picture of it there it is hey what's up barney it's dinner it's dinner time all right i'll be back after dinner one of the very few souvenirs we brought back from japan we didn't bring a lot back we had you know, were packing suitcases and kids and stuff but um, one of the things we got is this little piece. Oh, let me switch back to the. There we go. This little piece of the bridge. Uh, this is with permission. This is from the. You can see it's engraved on there. This is the. Um, from the. Maybe you can see it better here. I don't know. From the. Uh, the tour. They'd give everyone on the tour one of these pieces. This is the. Uh, one of the test pieces of the cable. It's a, a little test piece from. Uh, they'd test every. I don't know thousand yards or whatever thousand meters of uh of cable they'd pull these pieces out and then you know do pull tests on them and uh that was let's see it even says on here although it's all in japanese i, I couldn't read it but um there we go 
so each one of these suspension bridge cables has, yeah, you can see that, has some what? It doesn't say how many. Oh yeah, 36,000. So there's 290, there's 290 of these strands, these clusters, and each cluster has, uh, or maybe 127, I don't know. And then each cluster has 290 in it. So for a total of 36,000, 36,000 of these, these little cables, these little uh, monofilaments inside that giant little cable. So anyway, it's a, it's a very cool souvenir, especially for an engineer, you know, piece of, uh, piece of history. So that's cool. It was a very neat, uh, it was a very neat tour. They took us all underneath the, the bottom of the bridge and up at the tower and the elevator and all that stuff. There's probably videos online of, uh, of all that stuff. I don't know if I, I don't know if I took video of it. I don't think I did or not very much if I did. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fun, that was a fun time. Anyway. And, uh, so I wanted to go see it. So that was over here in Kyoto. It's on the, or in Kobe rather. It's on the other side of Osaka. And so I drove all the way from Nagoya to the Akashi Kyoko Bridge. And when I was about halfway, I forget where, somewhere out here in the, in the middle of nowhere between uh, Nagoya and Osaka, um, I was running low on gas. And so I was like, oh, I'll just find a gas station. Well, it's not like the United States where they just have gas stations everywhere. This is, it was a little bit tricky. So I got off the road uh, and I pulled into a convenience store. Yeah, it must have been, I don't know. It wasn't near like BY. I think it was down here on one of these highways, one of these little offshoot roads or something. And uh, pulled into a convenience store, Kambini, and uh, asked the guy. I walked in and there was this young guy there. And uh, I, I came in and I, I think I bought something. I forget, I, you know, to be polite and waited till all the other Japanese people had left the store. And it was, it was just me and the, and the cashier. And then I was like, ah. Oh, Smiyosen, uh, I don't speak Japanese. Can you tell me where a gas station is? And he's like, oh, oh, yeah, man, uh, go down the street. You know, he's like, no accent, just like perfect English. But he was just like, do I really want to like break break character for this this stupid gaijin? So anyway, he directed me to the, he's like, just go down the street, you know, and like take a right at the thing and there's the gas station. So, uh, they're very, yeah, they're very weird about like not speaking English out in the countryside. So anyway, I made it to the, the bridge. Um, where did I park? Well, you know what? I've gone into enough detail already. There is a whole blog that we did, um, my wife and I, although it was mostly me, um, doing the blog and it is spooningjapan.blogspot.com. And I'll put a link in the in the text of the thing, and it's just like a blog of of all the all the stuff we did in Japan. Uh, here's one about the drive to work. Uh, a lot of this that we talked about. There's a whole thing I think about. Um, yeah, crazy trip to Kyoto, the Akishi Kyoko Bridge. Yeah, so all that stuff. Uh, there's an, one on uh, my wife staying in Hawaii on her way back. Uh, there's stuff about the baby and having the baby in Japan. I, I didn't really experience any of that directly. I was at work the whole time. So um, there's stuff about that and going to the doctor and things. So uh, my wife wrote down a, a number of them. And anyway, if you want any more uh, details on that, there's the whole blog there. You can read all about it. And uh, let's see. Was there anything else? Oh, I guess the other, the only other thing that I did in Japan is... Um, because we had to go to Korea during the, um, during the, the, uh, scheduled maintenance, my, that wasn't quite exactly at this, at the three month mark. And so I actually had to make a second trip later in the year, uh, at, right around the time that the baby was born, like the week after the baby was born, I think. And so I went to Singapore. And uh, there's a whole thing about Singapore on the blog, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, there is. It's a, a thing about Singapore. And that was fun. I, I really liked Singapore. But, um, yeah, that's enough about me and about Japan. 
And uh, like I said, if you want more details, you can read about it on the blog. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. God bless.